basically Mike Tyson was saying, I'm not even going to get into analyzing this guy's character. He was good to me. That's it. I'm not going to turn on a guy who was good to me. And, th and, and you know what that is? Again, epistemic trust. Be good to somebody. Help them in their hour of need. That's it. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. All right, everybody. Welcome to episode, I believe this is going to be 32. Uh, very special guest here, one I've been literally trying to get for like three months. He's but been chasing me. I have been chasing you, Rabbi. But I gave you a hard time. I gave you the runaround. You did. Daughter's so wedding. That's, daughter's wedding. That's right. Hanukkah. You, you were throwing out all the, the, all the classics excuses. at me. And I managed yeah. to, you know, just calmly and smoothly circumvent them. Whatever. And now I'm here. Now you are here. We, we, <laughs> um, but okay, a couple things before we start. Number one... Um, if you're watching this, please subscribe, like, and comment. Guys, you're not subscribing, liking, and commenting enough. I see the views. Like, I see it. And we only have, like, 2,000 followers. The and there's, algorithm like, loves the engagement. We got to subscribe, like, like, and comment. And you know this because you have a YouTube pod. Like, a YouTube uh, channel. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we're going to get there. Let's, the other thing. Let's take care of your... What's... La second thing. Uh, this pod is sponsored by ENA Tax Advisors. ENA Tax Advisors is a tax strategy uh, company that helps you limit your tax liability. Um, if you are a 1099 employee or self-employed, uh, please reach out to Ellie uh, from um, ENA Tax Advisors. That's E-L-I at CertifiedTaxAdvisors.com. It will show up here as well. I have used them. Uh, if you follow me, I've, it's probably a broken record, but I've used them myself. Uh, truly saved me a lot of money. And people, by the way, are telling me that they actually reached out to me. And it was extremely helpful. So uh, it's free consultation. If it's something you're interested in and you think you need help with, definitely reach out. Um, okay, so to our guest now, we have with us... Um, Rabbi Chase Taub, who I really, really, I got to know you through Instagram. We all did. Yeah. And okay. we are all very big fans, Rabbi. But we're neighbors. We are neighbors as well. You're from Cedarhurst. I'm from North Woodmere. Yeah. Um, no, we're not really, I'm not from Cedarhurst and you're not from North Woodmere, but we. We live, we reside. That's right. At the moment. Yeah. Um, so the number one thing that. We, you know who I saw last night? I was in Crown Heights. <laughs> Who's that? It's okay if I interrupt you. Please. I know yeah. it's your podcast. You're the guest. No, you're the I'm guest. the guest. So. You're the guest. Free, free reign. So you could edit this out. I don't know if we're allowed to mention the competition. I saw Yaakov Langer last night in Crown Heights. Yaakov he also Langer. lives in North Woodmere. He lives on my block now. He lives on your block. Can I tell you something? North Woodmere is like the Jewish podcasting capital of the world. <laughs> and then I was, can I also say, I was, I was on um, with Nachi Gordon. What's it called? What's his Meaningful, Meaningful, Meaningful Minute. Meaningful Minute. Meaningful people. people. Meaningful people. There's a stickle breakup over there, right? That alone, I don't know anything about it. I don't either. I was on... I was on Mean, uh, meaningful people. I was one of the meaningful people. You are oh, you on wow. that? Well, I assume that it was called me. You have a one number episode, were you? Because that's your ranking. How meaningful? Oh, really? You are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on episode 32 with you guys. So that's how the 31 people more yeah, important yeah, yeah. than me. Okay. More mislabeled than you. More mislabeled. <laughs> oh, that's how it goes. You, yeah, yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I, <laughs> we're getting more and more correctly like labeled. You're mislabeled. Hold on. I'm mislabeled. I agreed to be on this. It means that I'm mislabeled. Yes, <laughs> that's how it is. We don't make the rules. That's how it is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and you know who else is your neighbor? Who's my neighbor? A good friend of mine. How do you know everyone who lives around me? And I don't Mordechai know Shapiro. What? Ooh. He's a famous singer, but I'm not even to music. So I know he has a beautiful, beautiful voice. He's in Kodesh, right? Is that what it's called? Morty, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in Kodesh, yeah. Beautiful shul. They sing beautiful. And uh, so I stopped there on the way to uh, the oil, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's oil, which is in Cam uh, Cambria Heights, uh, Queens. Mm -hmm. right? I've been. And uh, this is like the midway point between Cedarhurst and the oil. So I stopped there and I spoke at a shul and made Kiddush and then continued the walk. So this Chabad is... people are not scared of walking, by the way. On Simcha Story, on Simcha Story, they walk oh. everywhere. <laughs> like, oh, they yeah. show up to your show. Like, where are you coming from? They're like, oh, I was in upstate New York in the Catskills. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, what? Do you know like, what that is? It's called Talucha. The, Re the Rebbe was very into this idea that on Yom Tov, you go and you walk to other shuls and you speak at the shuls. Actually, I was just remembering recently, because somebody asked me, I hadn't, I, it was a, like a forgotten memory, but someone asked me when was the first time I spoke publicly. And it was actually on Talucha. It was, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was at a shul in Bensonhurst somewhere on, on Achrin Shel Pesach. When did you start doing Shlichus? What age? Uh, well, 29, I think. Oh, that's old though. Yeah, I was teaching in, uh, in yeshiva, and then uh, then we went on in shlichus, yeah. 
But is that is that typical? Eh, everyone has different uh, career trajectories. Career trajectories. I always thought yeah. that they go out like I was just in Mexico with Shmuley and Playa. A bunch of twenty year olds. They're twenty. Yeah, twenty two year olds. And I thought that that was typical. Twenty two. Mm -hmm. They're running a Chabad 20. house, or they were no, they brought out Bachram to Bachram. Yeah, to they have one, they have one they have one guy out there who's married. The guy yeah. with the orange but beard. But the permanent guy. Like, permanent sure guy is, is a married guy, probably 35, 40 years old. I spent yeah. two weeks in Berlin years ago, and the guy running the Chabad house was twenty four at the time. Yehuda Tachtel. He was probably twenty four when he went out. How long ago did you go there? Berlin. Five years ago. Uh, what? No, no, like. More than five years ago. It's like, whoa, Jesus. Like eight years ago, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, want, I want to get into one important thing because it struck me because you actually yeah. spoke about this. I, I want to ask you about this. So I, I called you, we spoke yesterday or two days ago. Yeah. And you told me specifically that the one thing that really drives you a little bit insane is that people think that. Your Ashkafas and your, and your talking points on, you know, stuff that you come across, people think you're a mental health professional. And, yeah, I do hate that. And that drives you That's crazy. Right. And the one thing crazy. you don't want is to be seen as a mental health professional. Uh, professional. And my question is, why? Because I'm, first of all, because I'm not. Isn't that, that, that should be an adequate answer, because I'm not. So I don't want to be mislabeled. I hear uh -huh. that. Oh. Brand awareness. Brand awareness. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to, so you're saying because you're not. So why does everyone think that you are? Ah, uh, that's a deep question. Why did they think I, I'll tell you why. I wrote an advice column in Ami Magazine for eight years. Yep. Okay. And uh, I, I, I don't regret that I wrote it, but it caused me a lot of problems because I had a very specific reason why I agreed to do it. I don't feel I achieved that at all. I feel like I maybe even achieved something worse. Yeah, like counterproductive. Yeah. yeah, negative. Yeah, yeah. My whole point of that column, I never read an advice column. I didn't even really know how to do an advice column. And Rabbi Frankfurt, Yitzchak Frankfurt, asked me to do it. I'm like, I don't know what an advice column. Is. He's like, just, just, you know, wing it. So, and I don't even know why he asked me to do it. He, I guess he, <laughs> he has that. He's a good scout, talent scout, right? So somehow he knew I'd be good at. It. So I was thinking, well, how do you do it? So there's something called the Igris Kaidish. Baba Chudeb's letters where he responds to people and all types of people, you know, rabbis and teachers and mothers and professionals and entrepreneurs and members of uh, governments. And the Rebbe's just answering whatever question they're writing to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe's answering them, something personal stuff sometimes, like big stuff, like communal affairs. And so... I, I just imitated the style, like a poor imitation of the style of Igris. And I was like, okay, that's what, that'll be an advice column. And, and, and I decided, you know, maybe it'll be a good way to teach some chassidus, that people should learn, people should learn chassidus. And in the end, that's, I don't think that's what happened. Basically, they just thought it was a bunch of uh, psychology. Wow. Yeah. So is that a, is, so what's your take on that? Is that a... A pro towards the fact of what Hasidus is, because everyone is right now gravitating towards the psychology aspect in this generation. So really, yeah. if that's Hasidus, then that's a beautiful thing, because it's, yeah. or is it the other way around? Yeah, where's, so, the, where's the negativity there? Oh, well, because instead of them understanding what about it they liked, they were like, oh, I like it, but they didn't understand what they liked about it. They didn't understand that what they found relevant, that, 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 there, were, that there were actual insights about the inner workings of, of, of how, 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 how we think and how we feel, instead of realizing, oh, that's from Torah. That, that's from a holy source. That Yiddishkeit is relevant. Yiddishkeit does speak to the human experience. Instead of having that, aha, they just assumed, oh, so he's a from guy. Yeah, I understand he's from. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's even a rabbi. But surely all this stuff he's telling us that we're liking, that we're, that we're uh, resonating with, it, it's from a secular sources. So it just it, it 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 further confirmed whatever biases they came in. With. It is funny you were saying this because Why? that is the first time I heard of you. Was yeah. wasn't looking at it on me that often, but right. once in a while I looked at it. I saw you. I until recently getting to know them better when they talk about you, thought you were an LMSW. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, hundred yeah. percent thought you were an LMSW. Right. Do you realize? I no, but to the point where do you I have realize a how memory, insulting this is right now? Oh, it's enraging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying <laughs> to make it feel raging. Like, no, it's uh, <laughs> I have like a fake memory. I've seen in print. Right. I can see it in my mind's right. eye. Shai's Tov LMSW right. on Rabbi. Now it is LMSW. it is a Mandela effect, false memory, 
because yes. it never yes. said that because no, it of never course. would say that because I don't have any letters after. Is my that the name. Mandela? That's the Mandela effect, right? Mandela effect yeah. is when you remember. Well, it's actually Berenstein and Berenstein. Berenstein Bears, yeah. When no, you, no, we have to explain yeah, what we're talking about. Berenstein Bears. No, but what about the Mandela? How you spell Berenstein Bears? People can Google these things. Listen, the references are going to go quick, and if people want to okay. stop and they want to... Roll tape, honest, roll tape. As, as someone who's part of this, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> You'll Google it afterwards. No problem, <laughs> in that case. But I, I never I never said LMSW or any other letters um, because I don't have any other letters, but that's that's the problem, is that when Froom people see somebody speaking about anything that's compassionate, relevant, uh, current, they're like, oh... That must come from a secular source. That guy must have some type of academic credentials. Rather than saying, oh, maybe the same Abishter who gave us the Torah is the same Abishter who created our minds and that the insights into how we, what makes us tick would also maybe be found in Torah. But no, that doesn't occur to people. Rabbi, first of all, I love what you're saying. And I was honestly not to toot my own horn, but I was speaking to Shmuel. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, what uh, was I telling okay, you? Okay, so there's two things. There's two things here. Number one, before we get to what you told me, I think I was the first one to, uh, not to toot my own horn, I think I was the first one to find you. Yes. To, right? And I showed you the label. I, I, I was before Rosh Hashanah. It was like before you were giving it, because I remember I was the one that sent you to go to the speech and I was yes. too tired. So I watched you on my phone in my bed. And, um, it was probably like July time, and I just saw some TikToks of you. And you're sending me his Instagram stuff, right? Some, yeah. some Instagram and TikTok stuff, and I, I happen to like whatever. We're mental health junkies, so even if you don't, you're not an LMSW. We are self proclaimed. So, <laughs> okay. And so you gained LMSW after you're in therapy for a certain amount of years. For a certain amount of years, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it works. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like a common law marriage. Yeah, yeah like exactly. Listen, time, I paid yeah. more for my therapy than they did for their LMSW. I, uh, I got something out of that. You know? Okay. We pay, yeah, look, we okay. paid for their college education <laughs> and everything else. And on time, and the house. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All these therapists have such nice houses. They have like private yeah. practices, making a quarter million dollars a year or more. Like, we're the yeah. ones, we're the top dollar right. patients. <laughs> um, no, so when I found you, one of the most beautiful things is, and I think it's one of the things about our podcast, is that. Um, we're very out of the box in the fact that I'm very open about we've I've had my ups and downs with the religion and struggles with you know Judaism up and down and uh, being observant or not being observant or being able to connect in certain ways. When I first found you, your insights, the I didn't say he's a rabbi or he's an LMS double, but just your insights themselves mm -hmm. right. connected to everything that I was reading in psychology and everything that I was learning okay. in therapy and everything, and it was just coming from a source. That had a yarmulke on. That was mm -hmm. a that was a figurehead. That was a rabbi, and I was like, "This is unbelievable." Because I don't know anything about your background, but everything that you're saying right now is literally connecting to me, mm -hmm. and I can connect it to just, the fact that so just the fact that just the fact that your name is Reb Shays Taub, you get it, and you get it. Mm -hmm. That's all. Right. That's and I was right. hooked. And from you the didn't first... think about where is he getting it no. from? No, you were just like I was just hooked. I was yeah. hooked. Okay. From the moment you said you said one line, yeah. okay. you said kids, you said children don't. Um, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. And you said that line, and it was literally everything that I've ever thought in my entire existence, like in the past 10 years. People don't care. And you started talking about everyone has Google nowadays, whatever it is. Your information is not like it is in the 80s. And, you know, anyone can get anything. Right. No, right. no one can get emotion. People go into video games. People go into comment sections. It was a whole thing. And this is where kids are kids are going there and seeking validation. And you basically right. that... That specific video, those couple videos, I was just hooked from then. I showed you the label. Yeah. He was hooked. That was it. And label looks at me. And um, label, as you can tell, is the intense one a little bit. And I'm not a little. A, not a little bit. Uh, yeah. And I'm a little bit more of the. I mean, right now I'm very excited, honestly, yeah. to have you here. Okay. So I'm like a little bit revved up. Okay. But, at the same, but, but at the same time, um, one of the things that like I think labels learn from me is that I a little bit like. Just sometimes it's just like, okay, things are going to happen in life. Things are going to do be and just like, just chill a little bit. Things are going to like, you know, evolve, just and, come evolve you. and come to you. And you don't, you don't have to like, everything is not, the world's not ending. And, you know, and he looks at me one day and he's like, by the way, he's like, I know your ups and downs with, you know, Yiddish kind of different things. He's like, you should know that all the things that you've ever said about whatever your father's taught you. My father's a great man. He's taught me all these things about life and kindness and empathy and all this stuff. He's like. All the things that you find in psychology books and all the things that you find everything's they're sitting in Torah. You just don't know it. Mm -hmm. He's like, 
And you label label said yeah. this to me. Label well, I said told specifically that just to clarify the point, <laughs> I was saying that if you get involved in, in Musser and, and Torah and the depth, real Torah is the depth of the human. That's really what it is. It, it's the all encompassing factor of life, the human being, and all those things. And when you dig into that, the, the, it's not just a bunch of rules. It is the aspect of the person who made man. So when you look at Torah from that perspective, and you read the Ramchal, and you read, you know, I'm sure the Lakute Sichos and all these different things, you start, it's not just what we were brought up with in Yeshiva, and you start understanding that all these principles were already there. They're built right. in. Like, and this is really what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Well, if I can throw this back to you, yeah. yeah. why do you think that people, because the way you, you frame this is, People see something that connects to them and connects to their psyche and connects yeah. to what's going on in their life, and they assume it came from a secular source. Yes. Why do you think that has happened? That's based on learned experience. But what is that? Can what we, is that? What learned is that learned experience? experience? And why is that it's learned an experience unfortunate, happening? I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I, I, I want to tread very delicately because I'm not saying this to indict a whole culture or a whole society. Well, let's indict. Show. Why not? But, let's no, indict. No, 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 no. I don't think it's productive to bash, but. I, I, I'll shed light. I'll shed light on a, and we could talk about we can it shed with, somebody, with yeah. an aim on improving. It. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people have had an experience where their religious education um, did not resonate with them. Um, they didn't feel that it. They didn't feel compassion. They didn't feel that it was speaking to them as an individual. Maybe even they felt that, they, that their individuality was being negated to, to some extent. And um, so that, that just becomes their expectations, that if something is Torah, Torah is milamailamata. That's it. It's just, it is divine wisdom coming down at you, and that's it. Take it or leave it. It is what it is. Um, and if you want somebody to sort of take you as an individual and understand what you're thinking and feeling and, and relate to you. For that, you have to go out of Yiddishkeit and you have to go to secular sources. And, and so therefore, those are the expectations that people have. That if it's relevant, if it seems like it's speaking on a, on a realistic level about human experience, about feelings, about people's individual experiences, then it must be secular. So they've gotten that based on, unfortunately, they've been conditioned to, to have those expectations, which is, I mean, I'll use very harsh words. It's a chilol Hashem. You know, imagine if somebody came over to your house and, you know, for a barbecue, let's say, and they're like, this is really good. This is, this is treif, right? Like, what? what? That's for sure. I'm not feeding you. No, it's a compliment because it's so good. I'm assuming you didn't limit yourself just to what's kosher. That's not a compliment. <laughs> so when people assume, oh, it was so relevant, it couldn't be Jewish. It has to be secular. It's very sad that that's the expectation. Can I, can I yeah. ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, or maybe say something I'm wondering if you would agree. I feel like the reason why people feel like it doesn't speak to them, you know, in sales, they say that you have to first sell with emotion and then with logic. If you try selling with logic mm -hmm. first and then emotion, you get nowhere. Because the human right. being needs to feel something in order to agree with something. Yeah. If you just tell someone something, it can make all the sense in the world if, if their heart is not there. Yeah. I feel like with, with Yiddishkeit, we're selling with logic and not emotion for the most part. We're selling with why it makes sense that Hashem, you know, created the world and runs the world, but there's some lack of compassion and, and sensitivity and emotional awareness to the people that are involved, which is what the human needs to feel. Like Shmuley said, the line Shmuley said, the human being needs to feel in order to, 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 to say, you know something? This feels right, this feels good. I don't feel like I'm being criticized yeah. every single second. Yeah. I feel like this is something I wanna do. Yeah. And, 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 and because we're going with logic, people are just like, at a certain point, they just burn out. They're just like, the hell with this. This is not fun. This is not enjoyable. I want, like, you know? And then in order to kind of cope with that, they go to all these therapy-based sources, and then they believe right. that the whole thing has to come from a secular source, because yeah. Torah itself cannot yeah. be from an emotional place. And I think that is, like you said, I, I mean, whatever you want to call it, I would indict that on the highest level. I think that is a that is the saddest thing in the entire universe. Like, you know, because it, it's a tragedy. It's a total, total tragedy. Be, be, because then, not only is does the person feel isolated and, and disconnected f to their family and their community, but also ultimately from from Hashem. So they're losing emotionally, socially, spiritually. Everything. They're losing everything. All yeah. nine yards. All in the name of become firmer. The person becomes not from. Go ahead, Zach. Well, 
I love what you're saying. Okay. And I'm also not trying to indict. I'm just okay. But I am trying to understand fully. Okay. Obviously, you're someone who who this is your your bread and butter is bringing out the things in Torah, and Chassid, which is part of Torah, all Torah that does connect to the internal person, to a modern person, to what they're actually going through, to their individuality, and okay. But then look at look at where the religion comes from. You got to go back to the books, the OG books, but way before there's Chassidus, right? There was, there's look at Rashi Tos, look at Gemara, look at even Chumash. Okay. There's, okay. there's stories with moral ethical rules in them, but one could say that if you go back and look at Tanakh and Mishnayis and Gemara, you're not necessarily going to get a lot. Look, where yeah. where is this relating to me? And you and you have to <laughs> where where does it relate to me? It, it, it's so interesting because you're saying well, if you go back before Chassid, this you just just take the the good old fashioned the original good old the fashion, classic the, original, the OG the Bible the OG you take the Tanakh yeah okay so first of all. It's interesting because Chassidus is not like another section within Torah. Right. Chassidus is a lens through which all of Torah is viewed. You're reminding me, there's a, there was a magazine that used to come out during World War II when Lubavitch first came to America. It was called the Hakriya Vakadusha. It was a magazine that was in Yiddish, Hebrew, and English, and it came out for American Jews. And there was an article in there. I'll just tell you one little snippet there. So it says that when a person learns chassidus, it changes their entire understanding of all of Torah. And we could illustrate this with just revisiting the first three psukim of Bereshis. Just the first three verses of, of, of Genesis, and to understand it the way chassidus explains it. And if you'll understand that, then from there you could extrapolate that all the rest of it takes on a completely new life as well. So it goes like this. Okay, first three verses. Bereshit bara lekim es shemay ve es aretz va aretz hoy sasayu va vayu va cheshach ha pnei tahaim beruach lekim marachefas ha pnei amayim va yemer lekim yehi ayir va yehi ayir. Okay, that's the first three verses of Genesis. Okay. So here's how Chassidus looks at those first three verses. Bereshit in the beginning, the beginning of what? The beginning of your life. First of all, this is personal. This is not speaking about cosmology. This is speaking about your life. Okay? But it's in the beginning of your life. Bar Elikim Hashem created two types of life, two paths that you can choose. Esa Shamayim, a spiritual life. Vesa Aretz. A materialistic life. You have two paths in front of you, each one of us. And what do we choose? What is the person? What do you choose? What's the next word? <laughs> Each, of course, that's the default. We always try the material first. And what do we get from that the, as the result of trying to pursue uh, a material life? It's, how do you say it? Dark. Tayo Vavayu is, 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 is um, it's chaotic, it's, it's, it's confusing, it's... Mishka babble. Yeah, Mishka babble. Yeah, yeah. So you're pursuing materiality, and it's just you, now, now life is confusing. And when you look for guidance, Vechoshech, then it says Vechoshech, Vechoshech, and it's dark. And he looks at himself, where is he? Apnei HaTohim, he's down in Dred, he's down in the depths. This is not good. And what's with his godly soul? His Nefesh Alakis? Veruch Alakim. His godly soul, Marachefes Apneomayim, it's floating out, it's fluttering over the, over the water. He lost touch with his soul. So this is not good. We only have one verse left <laughs> from the first three verses. Okay, so here's this guy, he chose a material life. It's Tayu and it's Vayu and it's Chayshech, Apnei Atayim. So it's chaotic, it's frenetic, it's dark, it's confusing. He's down in the dumps and, and he can't even get out. But listen how it parses that last that last of the three verses. And he says, who says? You say, the person, the main character here, you. And he says, Elakim! He says, Elakim, the person says, God! Not Vayemer Elakim, God said. Vayemer, you, the person, say, Elakim, God. You know what happens? Yehi'ar, there is light for him. And there's light for the entire world. So just in the first three verses, 
what do we see? We see a story about each one of our, our lives. It's a personal narrative. So he says, if you go and you extrapolate, all the, whole, the whole rest of, of the Torah is going to take on a completely new life as well. So that's what you have to understand. You can open up the Bible. I mean, the Christians also read the Bible, right? And you could read. See, the one they the most, read it a lot more than we do. <clears throat> that's, I was sitting on a plane next to a Baptist, and he was quoting me chapter and verse, and he was saying to me, uh, Proverbs uh, 21, 3. And I, I said, I, I, don't, I, I could read it in Hebrew. I don't know these, I don't know these numbers. But, you know, if somebody opens up the, uh, a Bible and he just starts reading, and he, he presumes that he knows what it's talking about. You know, they're, they're, that's the reason we have a Masada. That's the reason why there is a Teresh Balpeh. Because you don't just open the book and start right. reading. The, the most confusing thing about Teresh Bechsav is that it's a book that if you read it without knowing what it's talking about, it actually seems to make sense. It's written in code. Really, it would be more useful if you would open it up and it would just look like a bunch of machine language. You would say, I can't read that. That's in code. The most confusing thing about Chumash and all of Tanakh is you open it up, it's written in code, but you read it and it looks like it's making sense. It's, it's, it's I, I an error. Sentence. Yeah, it's a, it's a story. story right. so what uh, makes you say it's written in code? Because the whole thing is code. I'm not saying that it's not, and I'm not saying there's more. Because every, but... every word is, is packed with hidden yeah. meaning, and the only way to properly use it is to unpack it, to yeah, decode it. So you're saying you look in Chumash and you don't see it speaking about uh, th these things that, that feel relevant and, and contemporary because you just open it up and you start reading. That's, that you're not decoding. So you have to understand how to decode it. And if you do decode it, every word is speaking to the human condition with compassion and with sensitivity, of course. That's, that's something that you've, you've seen. Every word of the Torah is speaking with compassion to the human condition? Yeah, for sure. 100%. No, listen. I'm not a there's, rabbi, but I, um, I, I'm not I think surprised that it's a very. Oh, I think that it's very understandable for some people to see it, not see it that way. Correct. And then they based need to be on, shown again, that. Based they need on to be their shown experience. That. Based, based on their experience. experience. There's a based few on people, how it was taught over. Yeah. Again, there's a. I'll tell you one thing, and I'm not claiming to be like a yeah. huge Talmud by any means. But I was looking at a few people. What? Medium Talmud. No, not even honestly. <laughs> Solid six point five Talmud No, but I I I uh, I was talking with a few people like about this type of stuff. Torah, uh, just talking about why certain people don't believe in Torah and all. all you know the the basic yeah. content. And I'm not saying this applies for everyone because I don't want to be like devaluing people. But one of the big things this person was saying, and multiple people actually that I spoke to, was there's just so much misinformation and misunderstanding about the very fundamentals of of Torah and what is actually going on. It's just misinformation. A person's reading it like it's like not what it's saying at all. Right. Like you're, you're choosing to interpret it like this particular way. Like if you look at 19 different Mepharshim, it's not interpreted that way at all. And the difference between interpreting it your way, which is like by three people versus the 28 other, yeah. makes all the difference about how you want to choose to see this particular thing. 100%, yeah. It's, you like, know, so. it's like anything in life. You have your biases and then you see yeah. it through that lens. That's right. So I, it happens to be I have one question about Judaism in general. There is the idea, right? There's, uh, I guess, and I don't know. I could be right or wrong. I'm the most uh, of the three. I'm the most Amar. It's by far, <laughs> by far, regardless of where everyone. Just the way like, he says, just, I'm the most Amar. Just, just Stam, just right. Stam. I'm the most Amar. Okay, <laughs> but there is the idea, right? Um, I was talking with Label about this a little bit, and um, there's like you read a Sadoros and different things, and I personally okay. believe, I don't know whether this is right or wrong, one of the reasons for these things is that you're farther away, like obviously the, we get to the highest level, like farther away we have more Tuma, and rabbis in general, yeah. the idea of the Rav, of a rabbi, is yeah. is kind of like this, this bridge between a connection uh, between God and giving over kind of mm -hmm. teachings of what the Torah is to the next generation. And there's a reason why there's Besdins and there's different things and why... Um, the idea of a rabbi or the idea of a rav yeah. holds such a um, a weight in Judaism. And is there an idea nowadays that people are just given the term rabbi because they're because they've learned a certain amount or they're given this idea mm, that they're just a rabbi, wow. and that has maybe diluted what the actual Torah is saying because people are mm. learning from rabbis and learning from a hierarchy system, but at the end of the day. Those rabbis are not necessarily getting the teaching correct, and therefore that's what they're getting giving over. And really, the idea of what a rabbi and rav should be needs to be taken more seriously, and the people that are put in those positions need to have more 
whether it be Torah education or any education, internal education of themselves and anything in order to put, yeah. put in that position. What's your thoughts on that and like yeah. where that is today? You know, let's, and you're saying this, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking to myself, how many people's um, disillusionment with Yiddishkeit began not because they found, they learned something, they, they had a kasha and they didn't know how to answer it, but rather because they had a, they had a negative experience with a person in authority. And I don't mean necessarily an outright abusive situation, although understandably something right. where it's obvious, like egregious abuse and misuse of authority, that will really turn a person off. But I'm saying even on a subtle level, just where somebody is in a position of authority and they're not teaching with compassion, and um, then it's like, okay, if that's what it is, that's what Torah is, that, that's what Hashem is, forget it, you know? like. So, yeah, I agree with you that a lot of it has to do with the with the human factor. But I, let me flip it. Let me let me let me say it in a positive way, which is that if we can if we can empower teachers, especially parents, by the way, I'm very big into empowering parents. I think parents are the primary teachers. First of all, oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my you're speaking and, my language. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know why no, though? No, because I'm arrive because I have I'm I'm I am sort of inherently skeptical of institutions. So I like the idea of the family. I like the idea of getting things out of the big box institutions and more into the private homes. So I, I, I'm, I believe we should empower all teachers, all leadership, rabbis and, and, and teachers, but especially parents. Anyways, but that's an aside. We can talk about that a little bit later if you want. But I think we need to empower leadership, people who represent Yiddishkeit. And by the way, don't make any mistake. If you're a mother or a father raising a Jewish child, you represent Yiddishkeit. Whether you think, you're, no, I don't represent you, but you do, but you do. And whatever your kid is going to think about right. you, he won't be able to avoid but having those associations about God and about Torah and about, 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 about this whole thing. So what we need to do is to help leadership whether it's a teacher or a, a rabbi or a parent, to be able to connect on a more compassionate level. I mean, th to me, that's everything. That's the call of the hour. But one more thing is like, um, again, I grew up, I don't know, out of town, but like uh, I went to Chavetz Chaim and like the idea of getting smicha and things of that yeah. nature is knowing your day, right? You know your right. day, you know right. it enough, you know this, you, if you know, if you can... The flesh spoon falls right. in the milk pot and that's a rabbi. If you can spit out enough Allah oh, when you're a day inside. When I, when I yeah. became a rabbi, what did I get tested in? You're a day. Uh, right. I, there are so many disenfranchised people that I know right now that grew up from went to yeshiva systems that uh, the, the term rabbi gives them such... It's a trigger. It's a trigger oh my yeah. gosh. You have no idea because yeah. they think they're all full of shit. Sorry, excuse my language, rabbi. But that's the truth. They, they, they feel that way. And the reason they feel that way is because... And, and honestly... Uh, props to, uh, in, in genuine like to the Chavetz Chaim system. The one thing I'm not saying they do it, but the one thing that they at least claim is Torah or Musr. That's their thing. Musr, 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 Musr. Now again, I'm not here right. to say they do it, but at least the concept. I mean, to me, it's very nice. You oh, know, you're all, saying it's at not least you just know, memorizing. Right, right. You're, it's not just your day. Right. Because who cares? By the way, right. I'd say the other way around. Forget right. about the other day almost. If you want to keep someone on the derech, like we went back before. You need to, your, your sensitivity, your compassion, your connection to the human, for sure at a childlike level, a teenage-like level, when those formative years, you need to emulate. It's like, right, how do you teach? You teach best by action, right? So very nice, you told the kid the Allah because you hold it cold. But you know something? If you're treating them like a piece of garbage and you're not with them in their space, right, that person's, the, 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 the representation, the response they're going to have to Torah so is going to be a negative you, one, you right? Know, you know that, that clip that you saw, you said you saw it on Instagram? Yeah. Okay, so I know the clip that you're talking about. And I was talking about if my kid grows up and gets in trouble, I don't want her to say, oh, no, my dad's going to kill me. I want her to say, oh, no, I better call my dad. Right, right same yeah. clip? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. fine. Which wasn't even my quote. I heard somebody say that. I thought it was perfect. All right, and I said, children need to feel safe with us. And uh, and, and I also said that quote that you mentioned. People don't care what you know. No, until, until you know, know that, that they care. care. Until they know that you care. No, right? they care. Okay. Yeah. So, um, about the idea of children feeling safe. So, somebody commented on that clip, the same clip that you were talking about. Um, 
some uh, psychologist, an actual psychologist, a woman mm -hmm. who has an Instagram account. She's an actual What's psychologist. Her name? I don't, I don't remember, but she had like a hundred thousand followers, so she must be good, right? Okay, so yeah. she must know what she's doing. I have ten thousand, so <laughs> <laughs> we only know a tenth of what she knows. So exactly. <laughs> I was going to say other, like, doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about, and I have 10,000, but yeah, anyways, so, go on. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming she has some credibility, at, at any rate, but she, she left a comment on that clip, and she said, this is um, the definition of epistemic trust. Now, I didn't know what that word meant. Don't get intimidated. I didn't know it either, So, but I was like, okay, I'm going to Google this. What is epistemic trust? And then, I, then once I looked it up, I realized, because I... I I knew the word epistemology. Epistemology yeah. is a mm -hmm. branch of philosophy which studies the nature of truth. How do you know what's true? So epistemic trust means how do I know, you used an expression earlier before, which I won't repeat, but I said somebody is full of it. Okay. You, you, you spelled it out, but yeah. okay. how do I know you're not full of it? Epistemic trust means that I believe that if you tell me something, I can reasonably expect that it's true. That's epistemic trust. So she said, what, her comment on my, my, my clip was, what you just described is epistemic trust. Meaning, how is a child going to receive a chinuch from you if they don't feel safe with you? They have to have a certain amount of security in the relationship to say, this person is looking out for me, this person has my interests at heart, and then they could relax and then they can be macabre, right. they can receive from me. That's called epistemic trust. So when, once I read that and it clicked, the penny dropped, I said, now I understand what the Kuzari says about how Hashem introduced himself at the Aserah Sadibis at, uh, at uh, Matan Torah. says, what's the first thing Hashem tells us? The first of the Ten Commandments. First thing Hashem tells us. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. In other words, before Hashem gives us all the rules for living, first he establishes, so hold on a second, there's a relationship, Remember? That Mitzrayim thing, I helped you out, I took you out of there, okay? I'm with you, I'm taking care of you. And once you establish that, that there's a context, there's a context of, of a personal relationship, of somebody who's caring for me, someone who's involved in my life, someone they've established already that they're helping me, now I'm open to listen that uh, they have rules for me how to live. You, you can't skip that. Even Hashem, God Almighty, didn't skip that step. That, that was how did step we get one. A, how did we get a... Our epistemic trust in Hashem. Epist trust. How do how did we get that? Epis. <laughs> Epis trust. How do we, how did we get it with Hashem? Through the the Exodus experience, he Hashem came was, into Eretz Haaretz. We were in Memtes Shari Tuma. We were in the lowest of the low, and he came in, and not through a shliach, not through a malach. He personally removed us, and that became the basis for a relationship. Where then we were interested to hear his rules for living. So first establish that you're taking care of me. Then tell me how to live. I, I want to jump on one thing here. I, I think what you're saying, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, I think this happens all the time. The kids are very intuitive. We really pick up even at a young age. And, and I think we pick up all the time that our parents are telling us to do things for their own benefit, not for ours, right? That, and, and that's a very difficult thing I can totally imagine for a parent. I don't even have any kids, but I can only imagine for a parent to be telling us something totally for our own benefit, right? Yeah. Yes. Not for their own. And most of the time, because it's for their own, that, that's the problem. Yeah, and we yeah, pick yeah. up, hey, they're telling us not to do A, B, and C. Right. Because their own insecurities, they don't want us to do A, B, and C because it's going to make, you know, because it gives them more anxiety, them more problems. Or we represent them. Right. the neighbors right. thing. Or, or we're not. We're, 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 living. A lot of it stuff. is shame-based. They purely. A lot of the control that parents exert on children is, shame is purely shame-based, meaning the parents. They don't want to be ashamed of their kids. That's correct. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and the kid might not be able to give words to that. But like you said, they're intuitive. Yeah. Right. So, so you're saying a great thing from what I'm understanding that. You have to first make them believe that it's for them. It's not a din in myself, right? Hashem is just basically saying, making you safe, that this is for you, right? Like, I'm here for you. That's right, I'm here As for you. As opposed to I'm here for myself. I'm here for you. And therefore, yeah. when I tell you, um, don't mix wool and linen into a single fiber, I'm not trying to harass you or make your life more inconvenient. I'm trying to help you, and I've established the fact that I'm here for you. Would you say that even by something like that, which is a chok? Yeah, for sure. 
I you, thought the concept of a chok is that we don't know. There's no actual explanation well, of how you're going to do it. But the concept of the chok, I think what he's saying is that because they have epistemic trust in you, that even though there's a chok there, just trust this. me that is what it is, right. and that I, I love you, and that... In fact, it becomes it, more it, important. When, when something it, is fundamentally incomprehensible to the to the finite mind, then the epistemic trust becomes even more right. important. Because with Mishpatim, where Hashem says, mm. you know, uh, if, if you do damage to somebody's property, pay for it. Okay, I don't even I don't even have to have epistemic trust in somebody. You know, a broken clock is right twice a day. It's the idea of if a, if a three. I know I can trust you. If the idea is if a three year old's crossing the street and a car is coming and you hit his hand, if up until that point you showed so much love, that kid's not going to have trauma from the fact that you hit his That's hand right. because he's going to realize right. that you did it in order to bring him right, to right. save him the car. Yeah. Not you're trying to hit his hand. Now, That's right. if you were, were a three year old and you were getting hit all the time, and the same mm-hmm. kid gets hit yeah. in the hand, right? And not even just if hit the, all the time, but you were being hit, and even if you're not conscious of it, but you're being hit every time. You, as a child, your behaviors are frustrating the parent, and the parent is is feeling upset and in order for the parent to try to gain control and and to to make your behavior comport to what they need for the parent to feel emotionally secure and they're hitting you in order to gain their own emotional security hold on a second so the whole relationship instead of the parent being there to make the child feel safe now you realize that or even if like again i said the the child might not be able to articulate this until they're in therapy 30 years later but they intuitively sense the whole relationship is about me having to provide emotional security for my parent. In other words, I'm stressing my parent, I'm making my parent, I'm giving them Agmas Nafish. So my my whole relationship with them is that I have to make sure that I don't give my parents a heart attack. It's like right. and it's So who's fun- taking care of whom? What, who's taking care of whom? What's funny is that in Judaism oh, sometimes oh, I like how you that. Yeah, can sorry. I say one thing in Judaism sometimes I think the fear is in that people in part is, oh my gosh, I'm gonna make Hashem upset. It's like you're a three-year-old, a four-year-old, five-year-old. I'm going to do an Avera. Hashem's going to be really right. upset at me. Hashem's not going to like that. It's like this idea that you're going to upset Hashem. It's that it's that same concept that you're saying that like you're doing it for the parent. Right. It's like we're doing it for Hashem. It's like no, Judaism is for you, not for Hashem. Right. And yeah. like that idea of that whole Mishka Babel, how it gets so. I don't know what happens. How but... how how it's gotten so. Obviously, everything in life's complicated, and how it's gotten so I have contorted. A theory, right? I have a theory, yeah. and I don't know if you're going to like the theory, but I, I think okay. it's yeah, it's a theory based off my lived experience. Okay. I think that where that trust in Hashem and that, that idea of, oh, this is for me, and this is not about upsetting or doing the wrong thing, it's just what's best for me, really falls by the wayside once you bring in divine punishment. That is where... That is where it's like, don't tell me this is for me. If you're going to tell me that if I put eternal light on Shabbos, there's a special place in Gehenna. Right. And there's all these really fancy Gemars that get into like exactly what Gehenna is. And there's boiling vats of things I don't want to see on yeah. air. Like, that is kind yeah. of where you start to have a serious all where to go, yeah. where right. the trust go. It's so I, w- I would love for you to, I, yeah. to, to, to talk on that because I think that's, that must be deep in the subconscious of every person who yeah. went through each education. And I'll education. say one more thing on top, Zach. That's Great, unbelievable yeah, question. I'll say one more thing on top point. is that It'll I was work. actually thinking I was going to say also bad things that happen in life, right? Like, right. how you do we reconcile, how, how do you reconcile right. traumas and bad things yeah. that happen in life yeah. with God that only wants yeah. good for you? So, yeah. yeah, Related. Related, yeah. But I would say even like like actual punishment for like yeah, yeah. you did a vera, like... For that, sure. That so I, and, and, and I understand that that's probably coming from some form of a juvenile understanding, but I would love to hear right. a nuanced take on that. Yeah, <clears throat> you know they they give these fifty dollar tickets in New York City if you if you go over twenty miles an hour. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> My yeah, and there are certain roads like okay, so you live in North Woodmere, I live in Cedarhurst. Okay, so I go to Brooklyn at least once a week, many, many times more often than that. Four times a week. Four times a week. I work okay. there. Okay, I drive there. Okay, every you go down Conduit. Uh, sometimes out there, okay. Yeah. Or, or Linden, yeah. So not usually. Linden. You take the belt, but if the belt's back okay. Well, up, the belt is a highway, conduit. so the belt's not the not the problem. But the point conduit. is, once you okay, how am I going to go twenty miles an hour on conduit? All the years, conduit was a highway. You go forty, you go fifty. I got to slow down a drop, but twenty miles an hour. So it's part of my tax for living. You know, Baruch I don't live in the five boroughs. I live in Nassau County, where they actually come and the, they take your garbage from the side of your house. Beautiful. One of the perks, but and right turn on red, but mm. yeah, but what? Best a, part. Yeah, that's but I've been making those right. Far I've been the making those part. right turns on yeah. reds it's like an animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what, what, one of the, the the taxes, just part of the cost of living, 
is you know a few hundred dollars a month in red light tickets. By the way, I really, by the way, it's you. I really want my father to hear this because he calls me all the time, and he, yeah. he used to be the register on my on my on my car, yeah. and he gets the license plate tickets, and he always says, "That's embarrassing." My, and I'm, yeah. my name's Shmuel. He calls me Shmuel. He goes, Shmuel, just slow down a little bit. Just you know, you just little, go ten yeah. minutes, miles an hour slower. It's like I promise you, <sighs> you're gonna get there. Don't worry about it. It's yeah. just hundreds of dollars. Sometimes he'll yeah. pay for it without telling me. Sometimes yeah. he'll be like, "You're gonna, you, you cannot be able to afford this," but. <sighs> And I'm going to tell her if okay. Shay's town says it's okay, it's the cost of living in New it's York. It's part of the cost of living in New York. Okay. Very Ty, you heard it first. Yes. Well, why am I talking about this? Right. Okay. So uh, supposedly, and I told you I'm a big cynic about institutions. Okay. Supposedly, it's for our safety. <laughs> okay. I, I, I looked it up. I think they're making $15 million a month. Of course. On those tickets. Wow. Okay. So if, nice racket. If it's a racket, if they cared about our safety, I don't know, get speed bumps, put more red lights up. Uh -huh. But why do they have these tickets? The only thing they do, they're extracting money. If they from care us. about our safety. You could take fifteen million dollars uh, a month and pay for a lot of people's health insurance. Yeah. That, okay. <laughs> right. If they really cared, they about really cared it, about right. your your well being. That's right. Pay for my therapy. That's right. That's right. Not that's my right. tickets. Yeah. 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 So why am I why am I mentioning this? Yeah, why am I? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. let's say as a parent, I want to influence my child's behavior. Let's say there's a behavior that I think is an undesirable behavior. Um, and I don't want my child to do this anymore. So what do I do? I disincentivize it by punishing them for that behavior. What what, what am I teaching them? I'm teaching them how to be hyper vigilant, how to not get caught, or I'm teaching them how to not care when they do get caught, or I'm teaching them to think that the punishment itself is the price, and now it's fair game because I, I did I I I, 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 I for an eye. I if I paid the punishment, okay, so fine, you know, uh, then. That's that's the price of it. Like they say, um, there's always a parking spot. The question is how much you're willing to pay. Right? You can always park in front of a fire hydrant. Done right? many times. There's always a parking. Just how much do you want to pay? Leave right? favorite line. There's okay. always a price to something. There's always a price. Okay. So Dennis. there's all these. Right. If you try to influence a child's behavior by disincentivizing <laughs> a behavior through punishment, these are the responses you're going to get. You're not going to actually make them care about whatever the value is that you're trying to impart. If I'm saying I'm giving credit that the parent even has a value in mind that they're actually trying to impart. Like, by, but what I, what I mean is, does the parent even understand why this behavior is desirable or undesirable? Do they understand what value is at stake? Or is it even in, in, to their thinking, it's just something they're doing, I don't know, social pressure or just because... Um, Maybe I, just a personal thing. It right, bothers their own me. Shame, yeah, yeah. For whatever it is, it's just, it just inconveniences me. I don't want you to do it because it bothers me. Or is there a real principle? Everyone always says it's the principle. It's the principle. Everyone says it's the principle. Well, okay. What's the principle? Then what is the principle? What value? Tell me the value. So let's let's use the muscle of the of the speeding. The value is safety. I don't think it's safety because it doesn't accomplish safety. Clearly, in other words. When somebody is trying to influence my behavior and it's clear that their agenda really isn't what they say it is, it's really about control, it's really about something totally aside from my benefit, my welfare, my well-being. So that is not a way to actually get somebody to learn to value or care about what you want them to care about. Kind of like what you just said about the parents in, in general when that's it's for them. That's yeah. exactly what I'm saying. This is, Sorry, apologies. That's, the, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, <laughs> so let's say you are a parent and you want somebody, your child, I guess, <laughs> you want your child to care about something. How do you get them to care? Well, first of all, it has to be in a context of a caring relationship. That's first of all. The child has to know that you have their best interests at heart. But then, even after that's established, you have to actually care. That's why I tell parents all the time, when you think about behaviors that your child is doing that you, you consider to be undesirable behaviors, 
you have to sit down and really, really, really be honest with yourself. Because you, you, there, there's no point in, in, in lying to yourself about this. You think about the child's behaviors that you don't want them to do, you think are undesirable behaviors. Are those behaviors undesirable because they bother you? Because they threaten you? Because they make you feel insecure? Because they make you feel shame? Or is there really a principle or a value at stake? If it's personal, if it's that I just don't want my kid doing it because it bothers me, it embarrasses me, it, it, then I promise you, you will not be able to transmit that value. Because it's not a value. It's a personal preference. And what do you think? You became a parent in order to get more of your personal preferences catered to? That's the opposite. That's like the worst way to get your personal preferences catered to, is to become a parent. You become a parent in order to have people to, 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 to fulfill your, your preferences in life? That's not how it works. Becoming a parent is... Selfless. Your, it's selfless, selfless. exactly. Yeah. It's the, less of you. Less of you. You're there to take care of these, these children and to provide for their emotional needs. Not that you, you twist the whole thing that they should take care of your emotional needs. But it's funny you say this, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. it's very funny you say this because a lot of people say, well, having a child is for your own benefit. So you hear these people who are like anti-having children here and there. They'll, they'll, they'll say like the whole problem, people have children, it's really for them. It's for, for their enjoyment. So they should get the knowledge. But really it's opposite. The whole purpose of having a child is that it's not for you. Well, and those people you aren't wrong. I mean, those people are going talking from experience that we know they have probably met so many people who clearly had children. But that's not what it's supposed to it's, be. Of course. <laughs> right. are, I think <laughs> both parties right. are in agreement. It's that's not, not supposed, supposed to be. be. No, but, but, but they, they probably had parents <laughs> Who were selfish parents, yeah. and so right. they they got yeah. the message. Of oh, I can imagine yes. someone has selfish parents; they wouldn't want to have kids. I I, I hate oh, to do this, but I, I do want to. I wanna, was gonna say one thing. Wait, 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 I bring, well, we're. I think we're you, saying the same thing. Oh. We are a little bit off the topic of what I asked. Right, that's what I was about to say. The yeah. context of oh, divine punishment. We're talking about God, and we're, we're talking about, about punishment. punishment. Yeah, yeah. That's the guy that's the same yeah. Which you you are talking about punishment here. You are talking about, oh, yeah, but so, like yeah, but I don't know God's. I don't know if God is uh, yeah. sending people to hell for personal preference. Maybe we're bringing him shame. Yeah, like it's it's hard to know. He's never spoken to me at least. But like well, he did Harsina. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have oddly zero recollection of Harsina though. It's weird. Let's say that all <clears throat> reward and punishment <clears throat> in Torah is for our benefit. Let's say. Okay, we could discuss that, but yeah. before we discuss that, even if that's the case, if a person doesn't have a God concept that feels incredibly warm and loving and supportive, and you just come flying out of nowhere and you hit them, the first thing you hit them with is, Einish, Gehenim, what, what do you expect their God concept to be? In other words, are, are there are there such things as as punishments? Of course, there one one of the thirteen principles of faith is that there's reward and punishment. There's there's cause and effect. Of our actions have consequences. Of course, there is. But when that becomes the first thing that you tell somebody, the first thing and the last thing and the middle thing, and that becomes the whole emphasis, and that becomes the definition of the relationship. I, I, how do you set aside the, the the spiritual how how spiritually corrupt that is just from a just from an educational point of view, why would anyone think that that's motivating? It's just such a poor educational strategy. Can I say one other thing? You may say that doesn't answer the question. Is that what you're thinking? We're in the middle. No, we're in the middle no, of conversation. We're in the middle. I'm, yeah, I know. He's, we're in the middle. Yeah. I was, no, I was just going to bring in a different point. But. Okay, so I want to add in one thing. I don't know. Sure, Let me please, just add in one please. thing. The question really comes to me is, if you believe that... The way I see this is that if you believe the fundamentals of Torah, the soul, the concept of the continuation of the body, the guf is, 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 is temporary, right? The Torah has an, an aspect of tremendous emes to it. Then it behooves you to figure out the answer to your question. Versus the other way around, that if you don't, if you just want to look for something that makes the Torah not true, yeah, you could focus on the one question, but which, by the way, every great... Hold on, I let am, me just, let me finish, let me finish. Sure, sure. I'm not saying that you're fair, attacking. Fair. I'm not by any sense saying that. I don't want it... I don't want yeah. it to come across that way. I'm not meaning that. No, I just think I'm being mislabeled because I'm not no, coming I'm not at all to. at I'm untrue. Saying, untrue. I know, I'm not talking about untrue and untrue. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I don't think okay. you are. Yeah. I'm purely just responding yeah. to your question. Not that you think anything. Like, right. zero. Yeah. I'm purely just responding that if there were someone, like, truly, to think, like, this question, this particular question, by the way, is the go-to question of every single big uh, Muster Safer in the world, Hov Zalbavos, Basil Shisharm, like every single one discusses what is the concept of Onish. If Hashem yeah. wants everything to be for us, 
Why is there the concept of ownership? It's like literally like the right. same thing. I didn't think um, I was inventing the wheel. Right, sure. right, I'm just saying, what's yeah. the question, the famous question of uh, of uh, Pesach, you know, and Dayenu? Well, what's the reason? Well, the, the famous question, well, if Hashem mm-hmm. gave us, didn't give us uh, Torah and Arsini, how can you say Dayenu, right? It's the same exact thing. The go-to Hashem, question. Yeah, it's the same, so, yeah, but we didn't go into Mitzrayim, right. you wanted to take us out. I, the, no, the, but there's the famous merely, question, Dayenu yeah. specifically, oh. the Dayenu which says that if Hashem didn't give us the Torah, Torah right, I'm, I'm it still would have been... It still would have been Dayenu. The famous what, question what I'm, every what I'm, single Godel what has. What I'm nearly doing here is I, I, I'm, I'm actually for once not getting into I, true, untrue. I'm really just from the emotional, this, you know. Where is Skyrim? I want, I want the rabbi's take on like emotionally how we're supposed to do the work to feel so that let, positive let, let emotion you, connection right. with, an, with someone, with a being, with an entity that even with all the positivity is still seen as the great discipliner. In the sky, so what I would purely say purely promotional, not nothing to do with so, MS or not MS, or you know, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not here into truth claims. So th- th- that's why I, I I said earlier. Let's assume that all punishment is for my benefit, even if we're to assume that, even if we're to assume that, if that is the beginning, middle, and end of the relationship, if that is the main thing that I know about Hashem, the main thing I think about Hashem. Just from a from a behavioral point of view, it's not a compelling motivation. Right. Okay, I'm saying even if we're to assume that it's all for my benefit, why? Because there's no epistemic trust. You're telling me it's for my benefit, but what else do I know about Hashem? What else have I experienced in my relation with Him that makes me feel feel not think to yeah. feel that things are happening for my benefit? So what I'm saying is we. Even if you would come to me and say, I'm 100% sure that every Einish and Taira is for my benefit, it still wouldn't help. Because there's no epistemic trust. Because there's no epistemic trust. So Rabbi Taub, in your opinion, how do people in our generation build epistemic trust, especially epistemic trust that has already perhaps been broken or tarnished by their experiences? How do you, we, how do you start anew and build that with Hashem? With God. How do we do that? What are some ways that we can do that? So, I'll, I'll talk about a subject that I don't like to bring up because we're going back to how we started. Remember we started with the confusion? How people mislabel me? Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mislabel. Right. Brand awareness. Brand awareness. Brand awareness. We're just trying to sell merch. That's all this is. Like, comment, and <laughs> trying subscribe. Trying to bring you up as the fourth. <laughs> okay. But, so I don't like being mislabeled as a mental health professional. I don't like being mislabeled as an addiction counselor because I'm not one. I'm not. I have no professional training in the field. I wrote a book called God of Our Understanding, which is about uh, recovery from addiction, but it's really not. It's really, it's chassidus, but it's chassidus in the language of 12-step recovery. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? You want to meet people who have epistemic trust in God, like people who will tell you my relationship with God is the most important relationship in my life. First thing I do when I get up is I think about God. Last thing before I lie down to go to sleep, I think about God. You want to meet such people? Go to a room of recovering addicts. And and this this is what you're going to hear. Now, what's funny is, generally speaking, most of these people had very difficult lives. Nobody goes into recovery because life was going well. (laughs) Right? In fact... (laughs) Anyone who walks into a recovery meeting the first time, I promise you, they just had the worst day of their entire life. Either that day or the, or the previous day. Okay, In the past 48 hours, they've had the worst right. day of their entire life, or they wouldn't be walking into their first meeting. So you're talking about people who have had hardship. And yeah, and I'm not saying that this happens the first time they sit down in the meeting, but I'm saying those who stick around and those who recover. You're talking about people who've had real hardship, real challenges, and yet for whom spirituality is so real and God's goodness is so real and God's providence is so real. 
I don't think this is unique to recovering addicts, but I think recovering addicts are a good example of it. I think there are people who have really been through stuff. And it doesn't have to be addiction. It could be anything. People go through all types of nisyonis, all types of challenges in this world. And, and for some people, by the way, I've come to realize, because a lot of times people say, well, what, what's your trauma? What traumatized you? Some people are just such sensitive souls. And I think this is a little bit the category I fall into, is that embodiment itself is traumatizing. Just being in the physical world is Just having, having a flashback to carry around everywhere. It, yeah, is, yeah. Is, is, is tough. It's weird. It's just weird and unsettling, at best unsettling, and it, at times downright agonizing. But at any rate, you have people who have really been through stuff and been through pain and loss. And yet, who find some meaning and find some coherent narrative, my story, my value, why I'm important, why, why, why the world needs me to stick around and not just check out of here with all the difficulties there are. And generally speaking, such people, even if they're not religious, by the way, will be deeply spiritual and will believe in a higher power um, because there's something inherently um, spiritual about that idea that in spite of all the difficulties of life, my life has meaning and purpose. Um, I have no right to remove myself from this world because I have a duty to be here. In fact, that's what life is. Life is duty. Life is service. Life is about being here for other people. It's about selflessness. I tried selfishness. I tried selfishness. I tried to satisfy myself. It didn't work. Just made things crazier. Just made things more miserable. I had to surrender. I had to realize that life is about service. So those kinds of people, um, you don't have to convince them from a book that there's a God. Those are the people that need to be teaching others about spirituality. In other words, if we had leadership who were people who were not leadership just because they know they know what it says in the books about God, but because they have real life experience. This is yeah what I was getting at when I was asking the rabbi a question, which is not just your idea, but there has to be other factors that allow you to become a rav, a rabbi. Like but the, how are you going to test that? That's right. The thing. So it's difficult. Okay. I'm, okay. Not, I'm, not, I'm not bashing the and system. I'm not saying there's a better way to do I it. I'm saying we, we, the idea of no it. There's no way. There's no. There's no vetting. There's no way we can make like right. a thing. Okay. So after we're faher you on Yeridea, now we're going to see if if you're a real guy. We're going to. There's no way to. Right. Do, but what we can do is we can create a cultural change. We can create a cultural change. Cultural change merely means who, as a culture, does our community choose to respect people with perfect track, track records and that's one of the not people who us. had struggles not people who went it's through the, shit the, the and then got irony. out the other side right even though those would be the best teachers and the best rebate <laughs> and the most compassion the guys who get the guys the best that's right and then if they do get a rabbi jab, they get put in those yeshivas where we stick the kids who uh, never. right yeah right exactly yeah. that's the irony yeah so rabbi i have a question yes. so it's clear that you're you're a Hasidist person. Yeah. You are. And you, you know, whatever it was, you grew up it was Hasidist, or if you didn't grow up, it brought you closer to Hashem. Fine, it's beautiful. So I grew up completely the opposite, a, a totally litfish person, right? Okay. And, and I'm curious what you would say to someone that is, what are your thoughts on the litfish mentality? Um, is it something that you could appreciate? Is it something that, you know, just overall... You, it doesn't resonate at all with you. Like, where do you stand in general with the whole Litfish concept and like what speaks to you and what doesn't? I was just talking to a guy from Lakewood today about he was, he got very into this Chabad and he's trying to teach it in Lakewood, make a Chabura over there with some, with some younger light. And I was, I was, I was saying to him that, uh, by the way, I love Lakewood. I, Yotas Kislev, 
which is Rosh Hashanah Lechsidus, where did I fabrang this year? In Lakewood. We had a nice oil of four or five hundred Yingalite there in Bachrim. Yeah, beautiful crowd there. Wow. Right. So I, I was saying to him, you know, a lot of people get into Chassidus because they like the inspiration. I said, don't worry about those people because they, they can go, they can be inspired. That's not what, that's not, that's not what this is about. Chassidus, when I say Chassidus, I'm, I'm saying Chassidus Chabad. Is Chochma Bin Adas. It's Seichel. It's, it's, it's a Limud. So I, I, I told him that the, the Lakewood guys, which is primarily, it's a Litvische, you know, town. At least it used to be until, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we know about the cultural shifts and changes that happened in Lakewood. But um, at least it was established as a bastion of that, that culture and that approach. And uh, so I, 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 I was saying, lean into that. Lean into the, 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 the Limud. See this, or at least Chabad is a derech alimud. A lot of people think of Chabad as, in fact, before we started rolling, I think you said, oh, what's Chabad? Everywhere we travel, we need to get kosher food, so we call Chabad. So that's, that's what, unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, that's what people think of. They think of when we're traveling, we need to get food, we go to Chabad. Okay. But the, the reality is that Chabad is Torah's Chabad. It's a certain way of learning, and it's a very deep way of learning. And the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, who was Miyasid, the whole Chassidus Chabad, he Sorry, what chose. Does that mean? What does Miyasid mean? He, he founded it. He established Foundation. it. He founded it. So his whole approach from the beginning was very intellectual, um, as opposed to other forms of Chassidus. The other Talmud Magad, all of the students of the Magad, Baal Shem Tov's successor, was the Magid. The Magid had 120 students. Most of them became Rebbe's in their own right. And they had different styles and different approaches. The Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, of Shner Zalman, they used to call him the Litvak. First of all, because he was from Lita, and most of the rest of them were from Poland. They were Pelashe. But also culturally, he was different. He had that Litvashe, um personality. And he was very... Um, he was into... It talks about in Tanya. I mean, it's really originally from Zayar, but the Mayach Shalat al Alev, the intellectual control, and don't, don't get emotionally carried away. And whereas the other approaches of Chassidus were a little bit more about emotionalism and and expressing the heart, and the Al Treb was very much about the mind and about uh, learning deep concepts and meditating and creating that mental shift. So, anyways, long. That's a long-winded way of saying that somebody who's truly coming from a Litvisha background, I mean a true Litvisha background, I don't mean the, some of the trappings that get added onto it, which aren't authentically based in any Masada. You know, you, you know what I mean by that? When I I say that? It sounds like you're talking about me, but yeah, go on. Okay. No, I mean the part that's truly Litvish. But yeah. If somebody really, truly comes from a real Litvisha background and they sit down, they learn a mimer, they learn a mimer chassidus, they will chalish, they will go nuts for it. They will go crazy. They will love it. It's a very good shidduch. Somebody who comes from that background and learns chassidus chabad will, will be very at home in that type of experience. Um, one other question for you um, that I think I, it was interesting to me. Um, so we're all here. We're, we're single guys. I feel like you can have some insight on this. We're a little bit older at this point. Um, How do we get the ladies? Right, basically. <laughs> what, what would you say is 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 a folk should be a focus of, right? If we're, we're looking to get married primarily, which I am for sure. Um, I'm looking to get divorced. <laughs> I think I'm looking to get married. I believe I am for the right to the right girl, one thousand okay. percent. But what do you see going? Like, what do you think are like key points that I should? Again, I, sometimes I should just talk to me because I think it, like the points you may say to me might be or us might be relevant to a lot of people. Like when you see single people, what do you, what advice could you give? M marriage is not for the faint of heart. And that's why many people today choose not to get married. Like you were mentioning before, people are choosing not to have children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're not, they're choosing not to, to get married. They're choosing not to do many of the things that were previously, for all of human history, considered a normal life, and they're saying, I'm not interested. 
And 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 I think part of that is that we need to realize that a lot of this stuff is really hard. So you're saying, oh, you know, why should I get married? What's in it for me? Why should I have kids? What's in it for me? Well, maybe the answer is nothing. Maybe that's not, but maybe that's not the point of life. Maybe the point of life isn't what you can get out of it. Maybe the point of life is what you can contribute. And if you go into marriage thinking it's going to enhance your existence, <laughs> that it's going to, you know, everything is so good, and now I'll just put a wife into the mix, and it'll just make everything better. It's not true. It, it, it's not true. Getting married is total reset. You're surrendering everything that you've, everything that you have, that's it. It's over. There's no more you. Now it's this new entity right. called this couple, and and it's complete selflessness. I'll tell you a word from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He says... Who is that? What? Okay. Oh. <laughs> so... The, the taket, to give you an, a taste of uh, teaching from the Rebbe. He says that um, the Akeda, the, and the Parshas Vayero, <coughs> it's also the Kriya <coughs> from Rosh Hashanah, second day Rosh Hashanah. But um, at the end of the Akeda, there's an anticlimax. There's eight more psukim. And it's funny, because it's in Parsha's Vayera, okay, so that's, that's how many is left in the Parsha. But the Kriya for Rosh Hashanah, seemingly, they're picking a theme. Like, finish the, once the Akedah story is over, the theme is finished. But it goes on, there's a little genealogy afterwards. A genealogy of, of Avram Avinu's relatives begat 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 begat, 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 begat. begat. The, yeah the begats the begats. you know genesis is full of those begats oh, yeah. begats and Sounds it's like, like it's it's sort of like you have the most dramatic <laughs> moment arguably the most dramatic moment in the whole bible the akedas uh, yitzchak and then after that's done you have another eight psukim of begat begat but um if you look at that genealogy it's the gene genealogy of Rivka who is the wife of Yitzchak so the Rebbe says like this <laughs> it's not anticlimactic to learn about the birth of Rivka after the Akedah because the Akedah is not the high point it's not the dramatic high point of the story it's only a warm up it's a warm up act the Akedah is the ultimate act of self-sacrifice, right? No. It's the warm-up to the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. The ultimate act of self-sacrifice self is Yitzchak's marriage to Rivka. So after he goes through the Akedah, that's his, like, premarital counseling. Right. Then he's ready to marry his wife. That's really intense because he's saying more, it's more so than more allowing than your, yourself to be shechted. That's correct. Because it's the Powerful. death of the ego. Mm. Of you, just you being you. Yeah. As a self. As they a say you, you give up yourself. Before a man is married, he's incomplete. And once he's married, he's finished. <laughs> Great. But it, it, it all depends how you view the ego. So um, is ego death right. the worst thing that could happen to you? Or the is best. ego death the best Evolving. thing? So you've talked a lot about selflessness, and obviously that's a major country, like a major thing to life. Obviously, is selflessness and um, living for more than yourself. And people in recovery will talk about this, and a lot of other people talk about this. With that being said, it's very difficult to live your life when you're just as humans in what in the, in the material world that we live to just live selflessly. And there mm -hmm. is a concept that when you do a mitzvah, you get schar. Yeah. And schar is not a selfless thing, te te technically. It's you're getting schar. It's a selfish thing. It's your reward. Yeah. It's actually, I'm giving you a reward. When you give tzedakah, for example, it makes you feel good. There's an internal thing that makes you want to continue to give and give and give. And there's a little bit of part of that that is that I get something as well. And so there is a lot of selflessness going, like there is a lot of selflessness. My question is, how do you reconcile that? So in marriage, not just marriage, but everything in life that you're saying, to give out the ego, to give away the ego. Yeah. But so much of life is also that little bit of ego that allows for you to give 
because you know you're getting at least something there that's recognizable in return. We live and there's with, and there's in yeah. that in the Torah with schar and things of that nature as well. So yeah. how do you reconcile the two concepts? We we live in very interesting times where all the things that used to motivate people don't motivate them anymore. The whole question of what's a normal life is now you know, things that were just assumed that everybody wanted now Lavdafka. And you know why I think so much is changing? Because we're we're getting very close to a point where look, Mashiach's gonna come, godliness is gonna be revealed in the world, and everyone's gonna see that the only reality is God. Okay, at that point, mm-hmm. selfish motivations are gonna become <laughs> completely moot, out the window, irrelevant. Right. It won't be such a thing. We're in an era right now where that's we're already transitioning into that mentality. And we need to embrace it. We're not going to motivate people anymore with what used to motivate them. The, the argument is, well, you got to give them a selfish motivation or they won't care. And I'm telling you, it's, it's the exact opposite. Today, you know what? You give me a, a selfish motivation, you're almost telling me, you are telling me, that the thing I'm doing is meaningless. Otherwise, why would you have to bribe me? If the, if the work were inherently valuable, why would you have to bribe me to do it? We're getting to a point where, and this is what Chassidus teaches, that schar mitzvah mitzvah, that the good things we do have inherent value. We don't have to be paid. <coughs> schar can mean a lot of different things too. I mean, in, in Torah itself, mm. there's discussion what schar means. Mm. But ultimately, it means there's the satisfaction of being greater than myself, putting aside my, my ego and, and doing something for a cause greater than myself, for, for infinity. Now, does that sound like a hard sell? Yeah, it sounds like a hard sell, but you, you want to know something? The reality is it's not. The thing that we used to sell people on, that used to motivate them, doesn't motivate them Why anymore. Why do you think that is? Go test it. Go see no, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying, why do you think that is? Oh, why? Because, why? Yeah. because Mashiach is coming. The truth is coming out. We're going to see that there's nothing but God. And it's, it's, we're so close to it that the psychology of people is already transitioning toward that reality. And, and, and that's why, you know, Chassid is... Is that a chicken before is, or, or is Which, which one came first? Yeah, 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 yeah which first? one's... Where's the causality there? Look, we've been in Gaulus for a couple thousand years. And... You think we're just sitting around wasting our time? The Jewish people have done trillions of mitzvahs. And they spilled blood and sweat and tears. And that all had an effect. And that all made the world a more refined place. And we're coming toward the end of that refinement process. So why does the world feel so unrefined in a certain way? It's not. The, the garbage is coming out and we're identifying it. But the world is becoming more refined. And basically saying the world is emptying its the last uh, vestiges of the the garbage is being washed out, coming to light, rising up, and being identified. And we are moving into a time where the only thing people care about is truth, the real truth. All the old things that used to motivate people don't motivate them anymore, even children. You can't even bribe kids anymore today. Bribe them with what? I remember I was talking to a guy. He grew up in Russia. Okay, so Taka, it was communism. It was, it was a lot of poverty. But this guy wasn't even so old. He was talking about when he was a kid 50 years ago. He said the greatest joy he had as a child, one year on his birthday, his father gave him an orange. Poor guy. Can you imagine? Did you ever get an orange on your birthday? I never got anything. (laughs) I'm telling you, he's a real lip box. Imagine trying to motivate a kid today with an orange. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Forget about an orange. Right. You could go rent a private jet and fly him to Disney World, buy out the whole Disney World for him. 
I don't even think it would make an impression on a kid because that's that's not what works anymore. We're not yeah. animals. This is not Pavlovian conditioning. We're not being trained. We're 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 spiritual beings. You, we want truth. Right. As I hear it, what you're saying also is that all the things that have come about nowadays, where technology and social media and everything, all the stuff that people say is the biggest hate to her. It's basically the idea that this is a vessel of the way that God is creating all the things to come out and there was no social media and none of this technology and technology is a, a vessel for good and bad and one of the most goods that it's doing is letting all the garbage out and letting it out and therefore it doesn't allow for anyone to just live and just be in the dark after selfish things anymore that's an interesting and a lot of things are coming to light yeah and by the way i just wanted to tie this back to something we mentioned earlier but when things come to light and truth comes out, there is, to some extent, an unavoidable disillusionment process, which is also part of what this generation is going through. Explain that. Yeah, elaborate on that. Yeah, you find out that there's a lot, you know, there's a, there's a lot of imperfection out there, and that even the people that you admire are imperfect, and that every family has a struggle and you know, that we're all crazy. You know, like, yeah. Like, and you're saying that never was there. Well, it was always oh, no. there, but I'm saying that was never people brought were to able light. to keep it compartmentalized. They were able to keep it quiet. There's yeah. a lot of, a lot of secrecy, a lot of denial. And today it's just, it's, it's all coming out, but it's okay. It's not going to kill us. We'll deal with it. We, we have it's to a more with human it. to realize that there's going to be imperfections. I think a lot of damage perhaps has been done in Yiddishkeit because kids are raised with the belief in this perfection in the leaders. Can and I say one thing that is crazy? I was telling someone the other day, actually on Pesach, I was having a discussion with someone. Wow. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was saying one thing that I think is, to me, interesting. If, if we told anyone in life, period, that you have to do this perfectly or else you're not good, you would look at that person like they're nuts. I have to do this thing perfectly. Yiddishkeit is the only thing that we grew up with where you, you have to be perfect, but if you do it on very, you do anything wrong, you're now bad. The concept of, hey, I don't have to be perfect and I don't have to do everything exactly and I'm still good is a foreign concept. Like, hey, by the way, you could not do everything perfect. You can do an Avera right. and you're still totally okay because it's not expected to do everything perfect. There's this concept of perfection within Yiddish guy that the second you do something wrong, for sure the Lippish Welt, I'm not talking about the Yiddish Welt, the way I grew up, and yeah, I think yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. that all of a sudden you are now like, there's something wrong with you. Like like you're this Chaval, you're mm -hmm. a bad person, you're this, you're that, because you weren't perfect. But in any other area of life, if you want to be perfect, you're like, yeah, obviously not perfect. Like, of course. Yeah. And I think that's a and, very powerful and, yeah, uh, realization that a human being can have. Like, we're not supposed to be absolutely perfect. We're, we're human. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw up on a lot of things. The people telling you to be perfect per is are not perfect. Correct. It says in Tanya that sometimes the Itzahara will get a guy to do something that's not even really what the Itzahara wants to get you to do, but just to make you have something to feel shame about. Because once you start feeling shame... Yeah, that's right. The next thing. So if you knew what happened last night, why should I even dive into this this morning? Mm, right, right, right. Right? So he gets you into the shame cycle. Yeah. Can we talk about the shame cycle for one second? Shame cycle's a killer. I mean, nowadays everyone references the shame cycle. They think about Brene Brown. I, I don't even know if you know I don't know is. from Brene. I know who that is, but that's not where I heard it from. I heard it from Pedagogov of Tanya. Right. He says Shh. Take of that Tanya. Brene. By the way, that's, that's, that's classic. Like, well, I, and maybe it's not it. even the same thing, but I'll tell you what the shame cycle is in, in Pedagogov of Tanya. Says the Yitzhahara makes somebody do something, then he feels shame about it. Now that is painful. It's uncomfortable to feel shame, right? So we don't want to feel pain. So what do we do? Well, the easiest way to get to relieve the pain is is as a taiva, is pleasure. It just it's it's, it's distracting. You know, right. we cover it up. No pain, right. pleasure. Right. And 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 when you're looking to which taiva to give into right now. Because you're going to have to give them some time to distract yourself. Well, your standards are low because you don't have a you have a, you don't have a very high opinion of yourself right now because you're feeling shame. So then you do whatever works quick and cheap and easy, and then boom! Now I really have shame, even worse shame than before, which means greater pain. And now I need a greater distraction, I mean a greater taiva to numb the greater pain, and then it goes. Basically, Brene should start learning Tanya immediately. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd sure. be cool. Zach, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I did. I uh, One last quick question. Um, based off something that Shmuley told me next. about your teachings, 
uh, right before that we started the podcast. He said that you say one of the things you say about chinuch with kids is if you have a kid who is wild, mm. that you should teach your kid to be wild. I want to make sure that's something that you said, or is that something you said? There's a tick. Yeah, I, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, are you talking about the, the about the tayu and the tikkun that whole thing? I don't. Is, would there you was, agree that if a kid has a certain individuality that's a little a little outside the box, has a lot of energy, a me. little bit different? That you should lean into that because that within there perhaps lies the kid's strength. Okay, I don't remember exactly what teaching you're referring um, to. So I don't know if it's a teaching, but I'll, I just will elaborate. There's, yeah. uh, I was just, it was, I was on right before we came on here, and it, the thing was basically saying there's kids that are in the box, and then there's a kid that's out of oh, the box. Oh, that's also from and, the and, and 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 about Rachel and Leia, and we should teach the yeah. people that are out of the box, the quote yes. unquote wild ones, to. To be out of the box, to yeah, hone their out of the boxness. Yeah, this is also from the. I remember this, Ruffle and I told Shmuel, I'm like, yeah. we. I, now that I, I, I shared yeah. it, I said, where was this guy when I was growing yeah. up? Yeah. So, I wrote. so, so yeah. there's there's the Rochel and there's the Leia. There's two different models, and Yifas Ma'ira Yifas which doesn't just mean Begashmias, but it also means she's the perfect picture, perfect, good, well behaved. That's Rochel. Rochel is the the good girl, uh, the easy girl, the, you know, she, like it's not hard to be mechanic her and she doesn't fight and she doesn't rebel and just whatever. It's just the, the, the good girl. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting that down. And that's what some people, there's nothing, the person doesn't have to go and make problems where there aren't. But that's not everyone. Then there's, there's the Leia. And uh, Leia is uh, rough around the edges, and they wanted to be mashadach her with Asa, and she, it was her greatest fear, because she said, why, why, why do I have to be the reject? Why do I have to be the weirdo, the, the interesting one? The most damning word in the Frum community, by the mm. way. Interesting. It's interesting that interesting became such a damning word. You know that Goyim don't have that connotation? You speak to Goyim about interesting, you say someone who's somebody interesting? Totally. But in the from world, if you say somebody is interesting, like somebody calls you about a shit reference. The highest praise in the from world in certain circles is, oh, no, they're normal. R right. Yeah. right. They're normal. Right. They're not. They're nothing very, weird right. about them. Right. Yeah, nothing you, unique and, about and them. the worst thing you could say, <laughs> interesting. If you say, in, if you say interesting, that's it. Like, like done. drop them no like a hot open. potato. That's it. What does interesting mean? Does it mean that he is... He's, Gonna, gonna, by the way, what you're saying right now... It's going to be weird at the Shabbos table? It's such MS what you're saying right now. Interesting is a bad word. You're right. It's, the, it's like that word. the worst thing you could say about somebody. Yeah. Well, I, to, yeah. to finish my question, it's a double question, is yeah. some people don't, aren't, don't have the people in their life or don't have the whatever. Some people don't lean into their out-of-boxness, their wildness, their interestingness yeah. in their younger years. But it's who they are. Yes. And those people become 20-somethings. Yes. And sometimes 30-somethings. Sometimes 50-somethings who are now trying to parent their own inner child. Mm -hmm. What is your take on parenting the inner child? And I'm definitely talking about the three people at this table <laughs> who are in our 20s trying to... <laughs> throw us under the bus here. Let me tell you something. No, this no, is what, beautiful. What, what you guys are yeah. doing... First of all, I, you know, people watching this might not even realize that for three from single guys... To do a podcast, I don't think people necessarily understand the amount of courage that that takes. I understand. To stick your head out. I'm saying to people watching. The same people watching. Do they understand what it means in our community to stick your head out and to do something creative? I mean, that's very vulnerable, right? And to do something that's a little bit offbeat, a little quirky. Like, it, it's an incredible act of courage. And... I think this is amazing what you're doing because basically you're saying, hold on a second, this is who I am. Maybe it's of benefit to other people. You know, may, maybe other people will gain from these types of discussions. By the way, there's so much loneliness today. I promise you there are people who watch this podcast who wish they had a friend group like this and they don't. And they're desperately isolated and, 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 and alone. And you would be shocked the lifeline that your little conversation here is giving, I promise you, to, to hundreds, maybe thousands of people who otherwise wouldn't have that. I never thought of that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But in order for them to have that, you guys had to have the guts to be interesting. 
And I think it's beautiful, and I think it's very healing you. for you that. and for everyone who watches. I think it's really it's the nine eleven firefighters and us. Those are like the main heroes. I think the in two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, top, top. Yeah, and then I there's Ezra Snushman. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Flappish Girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll make a list sometime. Prioritize we'll a list. who are the really essential workers of the Jewish yeah. world. We're definitely yeah. essential. Yeah. No, but that. Thank you so much for saying that. That. that yeah. Means honestly, a lot. you should know something. Time. Honestly, Rabbi, that means. Truly, that means the absolute world to me. Did you expect you'd be doing this <laughs> with your energy? You know, I don't know. I'm 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 not a normal person. <laughs> I, I admit that. I love I, it. I no. I mean, it's it's true. Um, but I try to make the best use of what I was given. You know, Hashem made me for a reason. He made me the way that I am for a reason. He gave me my strengths. He gave me my weaknesses and my my story and my great moments and my. Difficult moments. It's, I mean, I'm just trying to use it in the best possible way. Like, why am I sitting here? Because I think it's so fun. I'm not having fun. I'm miserable. Why am I sitting here right now? <laughs> you guys are so intimidated by me. Cause, uh, <laughs> not at all. Very funny. <laughs> I was okay. at the beginning. At the beginning of the okay. podcast, yeah. I was. I was like, but uh, no, I only know you from your videos, okay. and now you're in person, and the personality. It's like. <laughs> It's a whole different it's thing. It's a lot. It's like when you're okay. texting a girl and then you meet them for the first time. Right. Okay. <laughs> so it's, quite, yeah, it's quite similar to that. So wh what I was saying is, why am I sitting here right now? Why am I here? Not because I think it's fun. Um, because I think maybe it will be of benefit to somebody. Are there more normal ways of trying to put out a message? Yeah. Are there safer ways? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure I, I don't know how you're gonna edit the stuff recorded here and but you know what it's part of the vulnerability of of the creative process and it'll be what it is and hashem will help and it okay. should only have a have a good effect on everybody i was actually it go leads into like one question i know you have a question also at the end it was like why you do what you do right now like what what took you to your creative process of because i because i can't work different. a nine to five it's, job what do you want me to do you want me to work right. in a shoe store? Like, what should I do? No, I don't know. I'm just, it's so different what you do. I don't yeah. know anyone else that's in shlichas or does Don shlichas and is on TikTok, on Instagram, doing all these things and, and putting his message out in this way. And like, what brought you to that creative process? And like, people seem to appreciate when I take ideas and I formulate them and express them in relatable ways. People seem to get benefit from it. So I do that because I think that's my way of being productive. Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. It's a we good have use talk, of TikTok. I've I honestly had another question, but it's gonna be too long yeah. on the topic, so I'm gonna yeah, scratch it. But I do have two things that I want to discuss extremely quickly. So I want to give the Russia Prokem on the rabbi. I want to just give everyone the Russia Prokem so they yeah. understand. Okay. But number one, we're gonna start with the first lesser interesting story. How is the hat, and what was the conclusion? The hat. Oh, the famous hat on Instagram. Can you it's explain to, to the watchers what what, oh, what okay. this is so about? So Sunday. Oh. Sunday, I was home, and my married daughter was also home, and my oldest son, who is back in Detroit now, he flew back today, but he was home. I guess basically everyone was home because of Pesach. That's, mm -hmm. So everyone was still home. And so my older kids were, were around, and I have a hat. Not my, I don't know, where my, where, uh, I have my normal hat that I wear. But then I have like a really smashed hat. Oh, that's one of the Litzvah Shatinas on mm -hmm. Chabad, the smashed mm -hmm. hat. Mm -hmm. So the untucked white the shirt. Number, the untucked white no, shirt. The untucked white shirt okay. more than the hat. That so, anyways, I have a really smashed up hat. It's really in bad shape. Like mostly, like sorting hat levels. So that's what people. I learned that term. Right. It's apparently, apparently it's it's Harry Potter, right? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that, but that's what people will say. Or as I call it, the Old Testament. What's it called? I haven't even heard <laughs> Harry of it. Harry Potter. Okay. It's a book. It's a series of books. No, I know Harry Potter, but what's the... <laughs> There's a... What's the hat called? There's the sorting. Something. Yeah, sorting. There's a... Sorting. Like, okay, yeah. So anyways, yeah. this is a hat that sort. really mostly is... It spends its time like on the, on the floor, on the mat of my car, like the floor mat of my car. <laughs> and when I need a rain hat, I'll just grab it like... When I run into the store, I need a hat. It's raining, and I, so I just put that on. It's really in bad shape. So anyways, my kids saw me wearing it on Sunday. They're like, no, you can't wear that hat. It's such a busher. You can't wear that. I said, don't judge me. No, I didn't say that to them. But what I said to them, um, I said, let's 
take a picture of it. And we'll put it on Instagram. Oh, and we'll that's... ask the people if this hat is a disgrace. So that's what we did. And it was crazy. I never got so much response from anything. I chimed in. <laughs> did you vote? I thought that I voted. What did you vote? Irredeemable I hat? commented. Throw it out. I did more it? than I've ever done any post. I said, Rabbi, as much as I love you, I think your children are right. <laughs> yeah, you wrote that. <laughs> you did write that. <laughs> they were right. So, but here's, here's, the, here's the resolution of the story. So yesterday, I went to Crown Heights. I went to Primo Hatters on Kingston Avenue, and I brought the hat in. It was very funny because I go into my friend Schlema there, works there, and and he's like, oh, yeah, my wife told me she saw your busted up hat on Instagram. I'm like, I have the hat. It's here. He's like, okay, give it here. So he 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 fixed the hat. And, it, it was, and I he, posted I posted it on Instagram. He, he was the machine of the hat. You're saying he saved it? He saved, yes. Saved he, the hat. He did, oh, yeah. He res wow. resurrected the hat. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, it's so, the yeah. same hat. He just, yes, he resurrected The question is whether the hat, hat needed to be resurrected and whether its purpose was <laughs> to be that hat. Can we accept so, the hat? Can we accept the hat for what it is? <laughs> You're gonna you, you watch the videos and then you'll decide. And the whole thing's a muscle, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Rabbi, yeah. there was one other conversation in our first conver in the conversation when we spoke on the phone yesterday, which I mentioned a couple of times. There was one other thing you said not to mention. However, I know Shmuley Warren is a huge basketball fan, as I am as well. Yes. But because of that, I know the story. Shmuley doesn't. Zach is also gonna love this story, so I have to ask it. As much as you're gonna be angry at me, and I know you will, but sometimes I anger people. This has happened all my life. And you didn't tell Shmuley and Zach the story about Michael Jordan. When Michael Jordan called you. So the context with, within which I told you the Michael Jordan story is actually, I told you that when I was on Meaningful People, back when I was a meaningful person, before I became <laughs> mislabeled, I, I said, so Nahi Gordon was like, yeah, can we talk about the Michael Jordan story? I'm like, yeah, this is fine. Get it out of the way, whatever. I don't know. Now everyone comes up to me. Can I tell you something? Can I a little bit be vulnerable here? Please, please. I hate it. People come up to me and like, tell me the Michael Jordan story. And it's like, which Michael Jordan story? The one you said on Meaningful People podcast. So you already know the Michael Jordan story. <laughs> what? what? Oh, like, what, what, like a lounge pianist playing requests or something? Like, you know the song? Like, I have to play it for you? Like, right. So. Yeah, so I don't like when people come. And also because it's like, this is what I'm about. Like, I, I, I work so hard to try to present something of value to people. And then, like, the one thing that they, they know, oh, the Michael Jordan story. Dylan needs to connect with you. I think because it's, yeah, gotta connect. it's an easier I'm missing thing. the NBA playoffs for this podcast right <laughs> okay. now. I need to know. Is it really the NBA yeah. playoffs? Yes. Right and he's sure. a diehard. I'm a diehard. The NBA playoffs used to be like in May or June. They are. It, it is. is. Also, this is the first round. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, did we, did we, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm a diehard also, first round match. Okay. To be down the clubs is closer to people. I think it's harder to go up to someone in the middle, of, you know, see you at Marketplace and be like, tell me again about shame and children. Like, that's like a word. But I wish they would. Like, that's, right, maybe that's they, a purposeful right. so people, conversation. Right. So the people who are listening, if you yeah. see them at Marketplace, you see them at Or better yet, yeah, really? Do you want to know how to make my day? If you really want to make me, like, have a positive experience, come over to me and say, can we discuss Perichov of Tanya? Like if someone comes over to me and say, wants to talk about Perek Tanya, I love that. I love that. I will talk to you all day, or at least till my wife texts and says I have to go home. I can't wait. I'm okay. going to call you up with that. Yeah. But people come over like Michael Jordan's story. It's the biggest turnoff. Okay, so I'll tell you quickly the story. I was, I think, 12 years old. It was after Michael broke broke his foot because I, I, he he was a rookie in 5 season and the broke Celtics his foot. Played, in the when he had the 80, the 63. That, that was the third season when he when he came that was back. Third season. In his second season, he broke I, his foot. By the way, I was at the in game. his second season. Whoa, 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 whoa. He, hold on. In his you second, at, died. Shush. Yeah. You were at the game that he dropped sixty three on the yes. on bird. Yes. No, you weren't. Yes, I was. We yes. tied it up at the free throw. Yes. 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 Bro, do you know the game? That's was crazy. But wait, wait, wait. Okay. But at any anyway, rate, I know. Basically, in second that season, he only insane. played eighteen games. So they used he broke to, his foot. So they used to uh, practice near my house. So a bunch of kids were chasing after him. They used to practice that at the multiplex. It was near a mall, Deerbrook Mall. So anyways, I, a yeah. bunch of kids were running after him, getting his autograph, and I ran after him, and he was getting into his Corvette, Air 23, North Carolina license plate, and I'm like, Michael, can I get your autograph? And I was like the last nudnik who, who came to ask him for the autograph, and he's like, move your hand away from the car door, I'm going to slam it off. Boom, he slams his car door. Now, he was probably just telling me, like, it's not safe, you're, like, getting too close, but I took it as a real rejection, and I came home and I told my father, Michael Jordan's a jerk. He told me he was going to smash my hand off. So my father 
sits down, writes a letter, but he didn't send it to the Bulls because he knew that like then it would just get like a, a standard, uh, they send you a picture with a stamped autograph on it. He found out where Jordan lived. He used to live on Willow and Finkston. People, there's a there's a mall called Plaza del Prado on Willow and Finkston. Actually, he lived on Essex Lane. He lived in a townhouse. This is before he bought his house on Windy Hill Lane in Highland Park. This is when he lived in Northbrook. I'm telling you, I have the CIA file on Michael Jordan. Okay, so he, my father wrote the letter. He went to the house. Actually, Dolores answered the door. No way. Yes. I'm sorry, who's Dolores? His mom. My father gave the letter to her and says, this letter is from Michael. Make sure that he gets it. The letter said, you hurt my son's feelings. You're too much of a class act to let that be. You have to call and apologize. So no reason. Way. He called me up and he apologized. <laughs> what? Your Michael dad Jordan. Jordan. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan called you. You spoke to him on the phone. Yeah, he called. Me. He called me. And what did he just say? <laughs> hey, what's going on, Chase? Yeah, he said. Uh, uh, do, uh, no, he asked me. Are you still my fan? Shay, Rabbi, Rabbi yeah. you hopped that this is the craziest story. That's yeah. nuts. Yeah. That's absurdly, absurdly. First of all, Dolores really answered the door? Yeah. I wasn't there. My father was The there. fact that there was no gate. No, it's just way when he was, he was young. He was young. He was young. Early he was young. Before second. he bought his big house. And then later he had a yeah, yeah, even yeah, bigger yeah. house on, on, on Route 22. No, he has a house that he's been trying to sell for years. On Route yeah, 22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. this the one. The one in Highland Park on 20. I really he had a house before that. This is Jordan. You guys are holding in his real estate? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one house that There's one house that he's been trying to sell for like 50 years. Yeah, everyone knows that house. The gate has 23 on it. I know every Coldplay song. I couldn't tell you Chris Martin's real estate portfolio. Michael, listen, listen. You have to understand something. Michael Jordan, if you're a basketball guy, Michael Jordan is he's MJ. There's no way around. There's no way around it. He called you. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, and he apologized. And you know what? Because see, this is more. It was like a twenty-second conversation. You said thank you. It was less than a minute. It was less than a minute. Oh, then he said, "Come to the next game. You come to come down to the locker room. I'll That's sign whatever you want." Well, and I had the Nike poster, the jumping over the skyline poster. I had him sign it. I've lost it. I don't have it anymore. I, I whatever. I'm sure there's thousands. Of years. I don't think they're worth anything. But any at any rate, that's. Do you, uh, what's your thoughts on Michael? Can you just give me the quick thoughts? Do you think he's? A, do you think he's? I'll, a, I'll tell you. Very please, simple. Do you think he's a goal? Is this, he not a goal? Th this will tie it back into what we were talking about before. I am tangentially aware of people who judge Michael Jordan based on I don't know. I think what because he's gambling, because he's being competitive, because they say he's not a nice person, because he wasn't nice to his teammates. What I've I've heard all the scandalous stuff. Want to know something? Please. At the end of the day. How could I ever feel anything negative about the man who picked up the phone? He did not have to do it. He called a 12-year-old kid and apologized. So that what I want to explain to you is he took 60 seconds to show that he cared, and that's it. You could tell me anything about him. To me, he's a good guy. So, uh, 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 so you have epistemic trust where in I have Michael Jordan. epistemic <laughs> trust, which it, this, this is coming at the whole thing. You show somebody... Real compassion, menschlichkeit. In fact, especially when you messed up and you you owe them an apology, and you can be a big enough man to say, "Do you forgive me?" That will win you a lifetime of trust. Can I ask you one question? Just yeah. one additional thing. There are stories about Donald Trump, and I'm yeah. bringing this. I know full circle, yeah. real full circle, where Donald Trump unequivocally, it's not a debatable, has done acts of kindness that are undebatable, uh, flown children uh, from kids even, from one side of America to the other side of America. We had no reason to particularly do okay. so other than a phone call from someone that he knew. Yeah. Maybe it was a client, whatever, but he did not need to go and spend 30 grand okay. in 1997 when he had no shot at the presidency. And he yeah. went and he did it and he put right? That's the same, uh, whatever the hell the word epistemic is. Epistemic trust. Epistemic trust. And I'll, and, and I'll back you up on this and I'll tell you, they asked Mike Tyson to comment on Trump, and you know what he said? What? He said, when I had my problems, meaning his, his, his legal, legal troubles, issues. he said, Trump had my back. He says, you want me to say something bad about the guy now? I thought that was very powerful. Basically, Mike Tyson was saying, I'm not even going to get into analyzing this guy's character. He was good to me. That's it. I'm not going to turn on a guy who was good to me. And, the, and, and you know what that is? Again, epistemic trust. Be good to somebody. Help them in their hour of need. That's it. That's all you have to do. 
That's all you have to do. But you could be the smartest guy in the world, and you could know the truth, and you could be eloquent expressing the truth. But if a person doesn't feel you have their back and that you were there from them for them for them when they were in trouble, then they're, they're, they're not going to put any million stock percent, what you I'm not, I don't per se disagree, but I think with Trump specifically, it's a very difficult thing to wrap your head around. Yeah, he's good to the people. He's a very loyal person. I don't disagree, but his midos are severely, severely But that lacking. makes the There's point no... even stronger. Because we know that he has midos royce in many ways, the fact that, and I think Mike Tyson was even implicitly saying, we know the guy is not such a tzaddik, but he was good to me when I was down. And that's it. It just and shows how it much makes, that's it worth. It makes it even more... I agree it's worth a lot. I'm not the saying that it's not. Stronger. What do you mean by the point is stronger? Just explain that last point to me. You know what? You, you might not even be such an awesome person, but if you were good to somebody, there's a bond there. Oh, for sure. 100%. Okay. And 100%. What, I, what the point we're making is that leaders, that's, again, parents, teachers, rabbis, have to be there to on a human level to help people out, to care for them, to, to, to back them up. Yeah, for sure. And if you do that, then people will ash to listen to what you he's have saying, to say. He's saying also, I think, you can tell me if I'm wrong, Rabbi, is that the opposite can be completely true as well. Oh, for sure. Which is that you can be the greatest person in the entire yeah, world, correct. the best Midos. Right. You don't and you someone. one time go up to some kid and say, stop that. talking during davening. Right. That's or whatever. It. That's it. You're a bad you person. Right. Done. You well, you can, you then can it doesn't forgiveness. matter It's not like it's gone forever. Yeah. And then you you can so there has, there has to be, that's the point he's bringing out. He's not saying that Trump's, it's up to God, a good person, bad person, way, you know, on right. the so weighing scale. The, the point I, that he's bringing out is just Shlomi, stop. Fearness, that's how important it is. In fairness, I'm always the guy to tell you, loyalty, loyalty, whatever, within, yeah, like, for sure. within context, as long as I haven't done something wrong, like, for sure. You take care of your friends to the death. For sure. If, if, if they haven't killed someone or done something blatantly wrong, like whatever, if there's space there. And I always do that. But I this is a point that I, I just based on the conversation previously, I think it's important to make out. But um I it just it's a fascinating this whole concept is fascinating. And specifically with Trump, that's why I asked it, because he has these complexities where you hear these stories and you hear these sides of him, and then you hear that you see publicly what's going on, and you're like, what the hell you is know happening? What's funny? What? Everyone does. You think so? Everyone has complexities. Yeah. Everyone's not perfect. Everyone, some people on a much higher scale, some people on a less higher scale, some people that are uh, on a little more famous scale, some people not. But what matters is one act at a time. Yeah. And that's it. Well, that's and nice. I think that's what the rabbi is getting to. And that one act at a time and acting with compassion can change an entire life. That's it. That's it. I hear that. Any closing? Sell on? with emotion, yeah. logic second. Rabbi. I want to thank you so much, honestly, for coming on. Pleasure. And I really did. You enjoy, it. or was this a burden? Um, I don't wow. really. I don't like wow. right now. I don't like social situations because I I do get very overstimulated, so it's a little bit difficult. But having said that, like I'm not like don't invite me to your parties because <laughs> you won't come. What if we have you as like a guest speaker? If I can come in and do my talk and then leave in yeah, a club, but. What, like a comedy club? No, no, no. Like, let's we rent out a space. Get up we're going to have like a whole do, party. Do but we have you at the beginning. Comedy routine? You, you're, that'd be uh, amazing. You say the pack of Tillum. <laughs> I'll say the pack of Tillum at the beginning? Yeah, but there'll be like dancers on the side. Like, <laughs> okay, we, yeah, They'll only bring them in after the Tillum's done. You'll be walking out the way. You'll wait, you'll wait till I leave. Okay, listen. The, you asked me a question. Did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's not how I. I'm not like a a person who who thinks that way. I think to myself, was this was this time well spent? Did I do a good thing by being here? Okay, I think I did. I think even if this never airs, um, I'll feel like I made a connection with you guys. I feel it was positive, so that has value, has tremendous value. Can we come for Shabbos? Yeah, sure. Fantastic. Okay, I'll walk it. What's your favorite bottle of booze? Um, do you drink? No, not you really. I know, I know. That's what makes me also <laughs> atypical. Come on, come on. I know, it's a part of the... You're not real Chabad, Rabbi. It's come right on, to come on. Yeah. I will, if you guys come out, I'll make I'll make the cholent. I make a very good cholent. Oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. You should know. I'm going to come, Rabbi. Yeah, yeah. you should know. I'm telling you. Yeah. Labels are coming only if there's two things. Good cholent, and do you have herring on Shabbos? Yeah, well, we get the... Sh you know what? I don't do it there often, needs to but be I, also, I also make herring. I make schmaltz herring. I love herring. You yeah. make it yourself? 
Yeah. Well, not often. Not often, but yeah, I do sometimes. Yeah. Rabbi, for me, you're going to have to make it. I'm just saying. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Done. Okay. Well, but seriously, Rabbi. <laughs> I'm, we're, we're 100% going. Okay. But I, but I truly, like, I, I don't just say this. I, I know that this is amazing. time is valuable. I even showed up to your own shear. I That's showed right. to your shear, Rabbi, That's to get right. you here. You I, pay, I paid in my you time. Invested. You my invested. mother went to your talk in Cleveland. Oh, because at Khabib High School? Of, yeah, because yes. I, she heard about you from me. Oh, yeah. that's I so posted, good. yeah, I posted on the one oh, family chat. I said, you guys have to listen to this guy. And you know, I'm I'm the, a little black sheep. I'm not posting uh -huh. rabbi videos to my chat all the time. Oh, and my, and my he's mother, posting a rabbi. Uh, he's like, oh, Shmuley is getting involved in this. <laughs> yeah. She went to your talk and she literally sent me, she's like, Shmuley, in, 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 in yeah. whatever of you, like in honor of you, I went to see her of Chase Taub. And she liked it? Yeah, she loved it. Well, she did it just to support you. That's, that, both. you know, that's First of all, both. First of all, uh -huh. both. To support yeah. me, and she loved it. And then she loved it. Okay. Doreen yeah. shows up in the comments here and there, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yo, shout oh, out Doreen. Shout out. Apparently, they're on Doreen first day is, basis. <laughs> Doreen is arguably one of the great comments of our of our time, right? What, what did was she say? One of the great commenters. She said, Shmoo what? Uh, no, I don't, wanna, I don't want to put Shmoo on blast. Oh, yeah. I think, <laughs> she said, I think you said, Shmoo, stop the cursing. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> like, right like, like, like in the comments. I believe she wrote the words, parenting fail. I'm <laughs> 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 no, parenting fail, I'm no. out. Peace. <laughs> 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 Anyways, Rabbi, um, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So much. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it greatly. We all appreciate it yes. greatly. Um, gonna keep coming with good podcasts. Um, yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed. Peace, love.